Um, mute yourself. I'm Nancy Hoffman Banyak, CEO of the Greater San Fernando Valley Chamber of Commerce, and we're so happy you're all here today. We're joined by our partners, the Carlsbad Chamber, Chino Valley Chamber, Greater Conejo Valley Chamber, Lake Elsinore Chamber, the LA Brewers Guild, which actually helped get this started because a lot of, I know there's a lot of breweries on here, North Valley Regional Chamber, the Marietta Wildemar Chamber, the Rancho Mirage Chamber, Oceanside Chamber, Santee Chamber, Temecula Valley Chamber, and the Torrance Area Chamber. And um, this is about ADA website compliance. Our chamber does this web this webinar almost every year. And every time we do it, we find out that there's been one of our, our members that have been um, sued by someone for not having their website ADA compliant. Or if you're in California, sometimes it falls under the California Accessibility Act. But regardless, there are um, frivolous lawsuit attorneys out there looking for um, a drive-by grab of your money if your website is not compliant. So we've brought to you our expert today, Mark Widower from Web Compliance Pro. He is a website compliance specialist, website development and marketing specialist and SEO expert. Um, you're going to be quizzed on that later. His company was founded in 2001, and he's well known for building websites for businesses that tend to do a great job of attracting visitors and converting them to clients. Since 2019, he has seen the growing and threatening trend of companies that are being sued by malicious attorneys and professional plaintiffs because their websites do not comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mark has developed an innovative process to help protect his clients from these threats, and now people call him by a new name, the Web Compliance Pro. He founded a new division of his company by the same name to focus on these website compliance issues. Now, before I turn over to Mark, I'm just going to let you know that we did a new website. We received a grant from the state of California for paid family leave, and I designed a website through GoDaddy because they have wonderful templates. And Mark had just done our webinar. Um, Fiumi looked at it and she said, that's not ADA compliant. You have to change the template we're using. I was very sad because it looked really great, but we don't need to, we don't need to be sued either. So um, we've learned a lot over the years from Mark. We actually know different things to look for, including a lot of people think just that little widget in the corner helps you. And that's, isn't always the answer to everything. So from there, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who's going to, um, give you a presentation. And then at the end, we're gonna take questions. He's actually gonna do a little demo with um, showing you someone else's website and kind of reviewing it. And you can put your questions in the chat and we will read them to him at the end. So let's get going. Wonderful, thanks, Nancy. Um, I think one of the things you'll discover in a moment is the, that maybe next time you make a website, you won't make it on GoDaddy as well and you'll find out why. I sent you a message, you didn't reply to me and I was in a hurry. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In any you were case, playing, you were playing golf. I was. Oh, yes, I was. I was uh, the first time in several years. So I, I gave myself an afternoon off. But uh, anyway, I'm going to turn off my video right now. Help me concentrate on what I and so I can see my whole screen. So I'm going to do that right now. And let's get going. Um, and I just want to start by saying that I'm I'm very glad that, uh, Nancy, that you and Fiumi asked me again to do this webinar for chamber members. And I'm really happy to be presented to members of all of these uh, other great chambers, as well as the Brewers Guild. And, and I gotta tell you, I'm a big fan of Chambers of Commerce, but I'm maybe an even bigger fan of beers and breweries. So this is <laughs> a great afternoon. Um, I did a similar training for the uh, San Fernando Valley Chamber two years ago, and some things have changed since then. And the uh, and of course we did one several months ago as well, but in the interim from a couple of years ago, a bunch of things have changed. and. The whole field, as you were mentioning, Nancy, is not very well known, and the more people who know about these risks and threats and can protect their businesses from them, the better. In a conversation with a friend, uh, I was discussing this whole website ADA thing, and we were talking about how it's so similar to the coronavirus threat in a few ways, because, well, first, you don't know how close it is to you. Second, it's a huge time suck and potentially very expensive if you're being hit with a bad case. And third, you may have already been caught and not even know it. So, and that happened to a, a company that has uh, since become a client of mine. They only found out that they were being sued because other attorneys saw the case was filed with the court. They actually saw the court records. And then attorneys uh, kept on calling to offer to defend that company. And so uh, they eventually hired or they talked to their own attorney, but we've since remediated four of that company's websites. And that's because the thing that they realize is that they don't want to be uh, at risk of regulatory threats that could damage their business and they didn't want to get blindsided again. So 
Hey, Mark, I just want I just Mark, I just want to intervene real interject really quick yeah. that there are attorneys that are literally targeting industries, and that's what brought this up, this webinar today. That's and true. they will literally go from from like for us it was breweries, from brewery to brewery, brewery and check these out and at their websites and write them a letter. And basically it's a threat, a threat to settle. If they don't settle, they're gonna take them to court. And because um, there's nothing really in law and the chamber's working on something with that already. Um, you're just at risk of losing a lot of money. That's exactly correct. And, and uh, I'll mention that actually in, in, in a little bit that you're hundred percent correct. They target industry by industry. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I mean, they, they, they target one industry at a time, but sometimes, uh, and again, we'll get to this later, but you know, uh, they do it by types of websites or locations and lots of other things. And like recently it was acupuncturists and we built a whole bunch of, or remediated, remediated or rebuilt acupuncture websites. And now, as you mentioned, it's breweries and hospitalities and e-commerce and so on. So anyway, the bottom line is that every website, every business with a website, which means every business now these days, should at least have the opportunity to know the dangers and to protect themselves. And that's uh, what's most important and what this webinar is all about. But before I go any further, I also want to emphasize that what I'm sharing here is my technical and industry knowledge. I'm not an attorney. I'm not offering legal advice. If you have any legal questions based on what you learn here, you should for sure talk to your attorney. Well, I've been told that a good talk starts with a little bit of humor. Uh, so there's this author, Jim Butcher, who tells the story of two campers who suddenly realize that there's a bear staring at their tent. And one of the campers tries to stay perfectly still while the other camper starts to put on his shoes. The still camper says, well, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And the other camper says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. The rest of the time together is all about tying your shoes and outrunning the other camper so that you're not the one who gets caught. More specifically, our goal today is to do two things. First, it's to educate you about regulatory threats that you may not know much about. Second, it's to show you how you can quickly and easily protect yourselves. But kind of in a nutshell, the real goal is to make everyone on this call less of a target for the fines, penalties, and lawsuits that other business owners may need to deal with and pay. Basically, there are two areas of website compliance that we deal with. And um, one of them that I'll touch on just very briefly is called privacy compliance. I know you're not here for this part, but it's important that you just at least are aware of this. And there's one brand new law and one other law that's a couple years old that are both about privacy and security that carry steep fines and possible criminal penalties. We'll touch very briefly on that. And then there's accessibility compliance, which is the, the bulk of this webinar. And uh, it's otherwise known as ADA compliance, and those lawsuits get more of the headlines. As we've mentioned, these lawsuits end up costing the owners, the business owners, tens of thousands, could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions, and it's just nasty stuff. So let me just say a few words about privacy compliance. So I'm sure you've uh, all seen those little boxes on every new website that you go to that say something like, our website uses cookies, click here to agree. And those, uh, those buttons are more than just notifications. When done properly and legally, the website should be preventing itself from setting cookies and collecting data about you until or unless you click that button. And so while there's no single privacy compliance law that covers all businesses in the United States, there are two laws you need to be aware of. The first is called the General Data Protection Regulation. It's a European law. And that protects you, uh, EU citizens and residents no matter where they are and even global residents while visiting the EU. It applies to every business website, whether the website is based in the EU or not. In other words, it applies to your website too, uh, no matter where you are, even here in the United States. So then there's this other law you need to know about. Surprisingly, California's own data protection law called the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA probably uh, does not apply to you. It's designed to protect California citizens, but only from businesses that meet at least one of three thresholds. The CCPA does not apply to your business unless your business has records of more than 50,000 California residents, households, or devices. Your business makes half of its revenue from selling consumer data, or your business generates more than $25 million a year in revenue. I sincerely hope that every company in this webinar uh, meets that third threshold, but in the event that you don't meet that one and the other two, uh, the CCPA does not apply to you. Uh, it's important to note that both these laws do not just concern themselves with your website, but also how you handle and protect consumer data throughout your company. 
And that's really all I'm going to say about privacy compliance, because I know you're not here for that. But uh, if you have any questions about it, please ask at the end of the webinar, or you can go visit my website at webcompliancepro.com. So now let's uh, move on to accessibility compliance. And this is all about making your website accessible to people with disabilities. As business owners, we and our clients all need to comply with all sorts of federal, state, and local laws from taxes uh, we pay to the IRS all the way down to local building codes. And the bad news is that if we violate just one of those laws, someone from the government might come knocking at your door. One of those laws that you need to comply with is the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA. You probably already comply with it in most areas of your business. And that's why you already have handicapped parking spots, wheelchair ramps, and wide doorways and wheelchair compatible sinks, low bathroom mirrors in your office. Everyone knows that according to the ADA, your entire business needs to be accessible. But the ADA is different than many other regulations because of three very important things. First is that there is a right to private action. That means that it's not just the government that can come after you, but angry individuals on a mission who can sue your business because, it is, uh, because the business has barriers to people with disabilities and is therefore not ADA compliant. The second is that by statute, the prevailing party also wins attorney's fees, which turns those angry individuals into professional profit-seeking plaintiffs. And the third is that determining whether you are violating the ADA is not so much a matter of opinion, it's very objective. If your facility is non-compliant, then simple checklists with measurements and photographs are all that are needed to prove your non-compliance to a judge. And as a result, there are people who drive from business to business with cameras, clipboards, and tape measures looking for ADA violations about which they can sue and then filing or threatening to file lawsuits that will cost the business owner tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars, and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of your time. And that may be worse than the money. The same kind of professional plaintiffs are now scouting business websites looking to do the same kind of thing. Uh, those plaintiffs and the threats and lawsuits they generate are creating headlines, and that's why business owners are finally realizing that the ADA's goal to make all businesses accessible applies to business websites just as it does to physical places of business. They've seen the countless headlines about how businesses are being shaken down with these website ADA lawsuits, and because website compliance is about as objective as traditional ADA violations, the lawsuits are virtually an automatic win for the plaintiffs. As a result, business owners typically give up the fight early and settle for many tens of thousands of dollars and sometimes more. And on top of that, the settlements generally require that the business owner finally do the thing that, well, as you're sitting here, you might also be trying to avoid right now, which is to make your website ADA compliant. So if the business owner does not make their website ADA compliant at that point, after they're sued, they could be sitting ducks for a second or third plaintiff to sue the business for the same exact issues. There's a couple of brothers, by the way, that are doing that. They do them in tandem. By the way, I generally use the term dangerous to describe website builders like Wix, Squarespace, Weebly, and Nancy GoDaddy. Um, take a look at this uh, second to last headline I just put up on the screen. The reason that is that these tools do not even allow you to build ADA com compliant websites unless you build the most basic of designs. And even then, they're not very compliant. As a result, professional plaintiffs have a very easy time suing businesses who use these tools. And on top of that, they don't support true privacy compliance. And then, so they're basically just bad news all around. You might've heard that a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court refused to hear an appeal from Domino's Pizza. They lost a, uh, a website ADA case to a blind man who couldn't order a pizza online. In the last few years, Target was also sued because its website was not accessible as were Burger King, CVS, Nike, Beyonce, and thousands more, thousands more. <laughs> but it's not just big businesses that are getting sued. They're just the ones that people are talking about. Small businesses are more often sued than large businesses because they are more likely to not be able to afford a strong defense, especially if their website is clearly inaccessible. And therefore their attorneys advise them to give up, give into the shakedown and to settle quickly. So according to the website, to a website run by a law firm called Safe Arth Shaw, they specialize in ADA stuff. In 2015, and this is these first two numbers are not on this chart here. In 2015, there were 56 federal lawsuits filed that mentioned a website with respect to the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
In 2016, there were 262, a big jump. In 2017, there were 814, and in 2018, there were 2,258. In 2019, the numbers were a bit flat at about 2,256, but then they grew again in 2020 to 2,523. It's a lot of 20s. And in 2021, they grew to 2,895. <coughs> On top of these numbers are the many thousands more that are filed in uh, more lawsuits that are filed in individual state courts around the country. That is particularly true of California, and you'll find out why in just a few minutes. So in 2018, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, actually issued an opinion saying that the ADA applies to websites, even though neither the DOJ or Congress had ever actually revised the ADA to include websites. So there was this opinion, but not actual law. And that's why there's, there was this big gray area. Well, making that gray area a little bit darker is the Supreme Court in October of 2019 with that Domino's case I told you about. So this got a lot of publicity and the result is that even more professional plaintiffs have gotten into the business of finding and suing companies like yours. Unfortunately, both before and after this decision, um, there were still many circuit courts across the country that offered different opinions on which business websites needed to be ADA compliant. They often varied because of the kinds of businesses, or the location of a business. It was very confusing. And that resulted in a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about whether a business website needed to be ADA compliant. So in March of this year, the DOJ finally put the issue to rest. They issued a statement uh, called the Guidance on Web Accessibility and the ADA that said, among other things, for these reasons, there we go. For these reasons, the department has consistently taken the position that the ADA's requirements apply to all the goods, services, privileges, or activities offered by public accommodations, including those offered on the web. In other words, here's the definitive answer. All web business websites need to be ADA compliant. The guidance goes on to say that the DOJ is committed to using its enforcement authority to ensure website accessibility and that the goods, services, programs, and activities that businesses make available to the general public are available to people with disabilities. But they're not the only ones who focus on this. As you've mentioned, website ADA-related lawsuits are a real business for some people, but you might not realize how big a business it is. For example, there's a visually impaired woman in Florida named Emily Fuller, who a couple of years ago sued over 175 small to medium-sized businesses that she had targeted all at the same time. Her targets settled out of court because their attorneys are advising them that they just can't win. The article goes on to say that lawsuits like this one are being filed by the stackful. And even with as many lawsuits as Ms. Fuller has filed in, California, in, in Florida, California has a history of being home to more ADA lawsuits than most other states. Why? Because here in California, we've got our own state disability law. Nancy alluded to it earlier. It's called the UNRWA Civil Rights Act that, the, uh, that has the potential to motivate people to sue. So what are the penalties under this UCRA law? Well, with the ADA, all you can sue for are attorney's fees and injunctive relief. But the UCRA also allows for cease and desist orders, which could mean forcing you to shut down your website, out-of-pocket expenses, general and special damages, and damages for emotional distress. It also mandates that uh, uh, treble damages for each offense with a statutory minimum of $4,000, which it may, is, this is why it's so attractive to sue in, in California. <clears throat> so how do you help protect your company from very expensive lawsuits and legal fees? The answer is you make your website accessible or ADA compliant. Those terms mean that people who are completely blind, people with low vision, people who can't hear well, people who are deaf, people who lack motor skills and can't move a mouse or use a keyboard, people with cognitive disabilities and others all need to be able to use your website. And as the DOJ has made very clear, it doesn't matter if your website sells products uh, or simply promotes and describes your business. It doesn't matter if your business has a thousand employees or just one. It also doesn't matter if you do $100 million in revenue or $100 in revenue. If your website represents your business and through its text, images, shopping cart, or other features, 
can help someone to do business with you, then it needs to help people with all of the above disabilities to do business with you. So how can you make your website ADA compliant? The way most of that is done is by recoding your website according to a set of technical standards so it can be read by special software or devices that are used by people with disabilities when they access your website. Your website code and that software all have to abide by the same standards and guidelines. The World Wide Web Consortium is the organization that sets a lot of technology standards, including HTML and HTTP. In 1999, that long ago, 23 years ago, the W3C began developing a standard called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, specifically to help those with disabilities access the internet. They're now up to version 2.1. Within the WCAG are different levels of accessibility designated as A, AA, and AAA. The, the uh, de facto standard for ADA on the web, the standard cited in most court cases is AA. So when you hear someone talking about ADA for websites, what they're talking about is meeting the WCAG 2.1 AA standard. I think you'll agree that's a mouthful, but it will also shortly mean complying with WCAG 2.2, which is uh, due later this year. There are over 90 different requirements of the WCAG that allow people with disabilities to use screen reader software or other special devices to read and use websites. Among the easiest to test WCAG violations, which naturally are then frequently mentioned in lawsuits are these. Failing to properly code images so that screen reader software can accurately describe the photos to blind people. And since blind users not only can't see the images, but can't see the mouse pointer, they need to be able to navigate the entire website using just the keyboard. And therefore the, the website needs to have special coding for menus, headings, forms, buttons, and links. You also need high color contrast between foreground text and background color so that those with limited vision and people who are colorblind can read the text on your site without a screen reader. Your website visitors must have the ability to stop or prevent animations that might provoke seizures in people with epilepsy or similar conditions. And you need captions on videos so that deaf people can know what's being said and even to know when nothing is being said. And all that has to be done not only for people viewing your website on a desktop PC, but also for people on mobile devices and tablets and cell phones and so on. So every time I speak about website accessibility in the ADA, I get a lot of questions about it. So I put a, uh, a few questions and answers together for you before I answer these. I want to remind everyone that I, again, not an attorney, not giving you legal advice I'm telling you technical stuff. If you have legal questions, talk to your attorney. So um, these first questions are about who needs to comply. Here we go. I bet you can guess all the answers to all of these questions even before I give you the answer. I'm the only employee in my business and I barely make enough for my business as it is. Does my website need to comply with the ADA? The answer is the DOJ's recent opinion has made this very clear. All business websites need to be ADA compliant. There are no size limits either in terms of employees, number of sales, number of products or services offered, the amount of revenue or anything else. Next question. I run a nonprofit organization. Does my nonprofit or charity also need to be ADA compliant? Yes. In fact, one of the examples listed in the new DOJ opinion from, in, from March refers specifically to a nonprofit business. Next one. My business doesn't sell anything online. All sales are done at my physical location. Does my website still need to be ADA compliant? Again, the answer is yes. If a disabled person can't learn about your business through your website, they're effectively barred from doing business with you just as they might be if they, uh, if they were a, uh, if they're wheelchair bound, let's say, and uh, all you had were stairs leading up to the front of your building and didn't have a ramp. So these next questions, three more, are about fixing your site to make it ADA compliant. <clears throat> Here's a common first one. Can't I just get one of those little widgets or overlays to make my website ADA compliant? 
The answer is usually no. While some of these overlay products can be helpful in making a website more ADA compliant, none of them can make every website ADA compliant on their own, including the one that we sometimes use. So uh, we've actually come across some of these overlays that make the website even harder for people with disabilities to use. If you're going to uh, use an overlay, it should be used only for the specific issues that it's capable of fixing, and uh, you should uh, consciously choose it for those particular purposes. Otherwise, you should modify the website, uh, uh, fix the website manually. Can all websites be made ADA compliant? The answer is no. As I mentioned earlier, there are some website builders like GoDaddy and Wix and some others that last time I checked make it relatively easy to make your own website, but were not built with accessibility in mind. As a result, websites made with those tools are not ADA compliant and are, and are prime targets for lawsuits. Your only choice would be to rebuild the site with a better, more ADA compliant tool. Next question, what does it take to make a website ADA compliant? In order to uh, make a website compliant, you must first need to know what issues are making it non-compliant. So first you have to test it. And the first way we test it is uh, using automated testing tools. And then by actually using the site with assistive technology, like a screen reader, as I was explaining. And once the issues are identified, then you need to decide how to fix it. Some issues can be fixed with those little widgets, but um, others, most of them require some programming or recoding or, or, or modifications. So I'm gonna uh, demonstrate now a little bit about some, uh, uh, some websites, some people volunteered. Uh, Nancy, if you, or Fiumi, if you have a comment or something that you want to make while I uh, uh, pause, uh, while I go get the, the, uh, uh, my browser opened up. Well, I, I do know, well, first of all, I'm, if you're putting a question in the chat, I'm putting on a separate piece of paper so we don't lose it in that way. We'll take your question at the end. Um, you know, I do know that I watch Mark like evaluate some of these websites and it's very fascinating. And I ask web builders all the time, is my website going to be compliant? And I have even asked GoDaddy that, and they they tell you it is, but I don't think they actually understand the intricacy. I don't know how to say that word. You know what I mean? The, and thank you uh, for it. And so it's you know you want to make sure that you're actually checking with someone. And I'm sure like every wherever your community is, you probably have someone in your chamber. Um, if not, we have Mark, um, but. Um, check with your chamber too and see who they have because this is really important um, to keep yourself from being sued. We, we've already had several of our members and some of the breweries that we like love to drink at call us because oh. they've had problems. And so that's how, um, why we're here today. And we're glad you're here to learn about it. Wonderful. All right, well, great. Well, let's get going here. Can you see Lawless Brewing here on the screen? Yes. So speaking of breweries, um, Nancy, I, I know you've talked about this uh, brewery a bunch. I know you, you're a big fan. It's a great looking site. Um, and we have uh, a variety of tools that we use to technically evaluate a website like this or, or any other. Let's just scroll through it real quick. See what's on the page. It's real sharp, very nice looking. Uh, Nancy, do you know is the uh, owner of this website on the on the call today? Yeah, Ben's here. Great. Hi, Ben. Sure is. Hi, I am. So nice. It's very very nicely uh, done website. Uh, we have a variety of tools. I'm going to just use one of them right now to show you just a couple of things. Uh, this tool. Actually, before I before I get into this, let me just say this that I mentioned in the um, in the PowerPoint stuff that we do two kinds of tests. We do automated tests with tools, and then we also do, uh, we actually do usage tests. We actually use the website with a screen reader to, uh, to see how it works in that, in that context, because um, your website could be technically compliant, but it may still uh, pose barriers for somebody actually trying to use the website. So, uh, and you'll see an example of that uh, here. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this on and you can see, well, gee, there's only seven errors here and, and, and they look potentially pretty simple. And let me, let me also reiterate one of the thing that, that the whole point here with ADA compliance and, and what the ADA says 
is that people with disabilities should be able to enjoy the same business uh, the way that the general population would enjoy it. So we're going to see some of those issues coming up here as well. So anyway, this says that there's three issues, and those three issues happen to be empty links. Well, on the scale of, of uh, errors, an empty link is not the worst thing, especially when there's only a few of them. Not a big deal. This system will tell us where they are. They happen to be down here by your social media links. Uh, so it appears as though, by the way, these testing tools are not 100% perfect, but this says that these are problems. Okay, not a big deal. Then there's also four contrast errors. What's a contrast error? The any text on a on a website needs to have uh, enough contrast between the, the the foreground text and the background color. Uh, as a matter of fact, mathematically, it has to have at least a three and a half to one contrast ratio. Well, it just so happens that you have these asterisks here that are yellow that provide a lower contrast ratio. Now that's not strictly speaking text. But that's what this is telling us right here, that these little asterisks are a one and a half to one contrast ratio. And you have yellow in actual text, I think somewhere else also. Actually, as I recall, uh, it is on the button, uh, on this button right here, this submit button. So if you made that black text, then that'd be okay. And, and so then you can look at that and you can say, well, gee, um, that's almost nothing. I think we're going to be just fine. Well, there's some other things too. First off, one of the things that's important to understand is, is what it's like when a person is using the website with a screen reader. And when they're using it with a screen reader, um, they, they're listening to the website. And in order to listen, you have to be able to organize what you're hearing in your mind, because you certainly cannot see it on the page. And the way that we, that we organize uh, in our mind, at least with a website, with a web page, is we, we, we think about the headings on a page. So just the way that you and I, Ben, would be looking through this website and saying, well, gee, here's the craft beer with an LA attitude part. And down here is the come visit our tap room part. So I know that there's content here about that. And then here's, you know, something about here's a heading beer releases and, you know, food events and merchandise and then uh, updates and events and so on. I've organized that in my mind. When I go visit a website, and I think you and most other people are the same way, they're gonna go scroll through the page and say, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. Let me go back up here and zoom in on the stuff I'm interested in. That's how we work. Well, in order for that to be helpful, uh, or in order for that to be possible, I should say, for somebody with, um, uh, with uh, let's say, a visual disability, somebody who can't see or has very low vision, they need to be able to understand the structure of the website simply by he the heading levels. These heading levels are numbered, as you can see. Here's a one, here's a four, here's a five, and so on. The heading level has to go from, there, there should be one and only one heading level one on any page, because that is the, like, the topic sentence of the page. And then below that, there can be one or more H2s, but the H, there has to be an H2 that follows an H1. And here you have all this other stuff. You can have one or more H2s, and then below any H2 has to be one or more, zero or more H3. In other words, you can't have, you can't go from H2 to H4 or H5 and so on. I'm not going to get into the weeds on this. All I'm going to tell you is that if you can remember learning outlines in third grade or fifth grade English uh, in elementary school or junior high or whenever you learned it, it's like that. It's an outline. And that's what somebody who can't see, that's how they organize the information in their head. This is a WCAG violation, although this particular tool doesn't uh, report it as that, uh, that way. But this is a problem. So um, it's not the worst problem, but it's a problem. But here's the bigger problem. I'm going to turn this off, and I'm going to do something that probably none of you have ever seen before. We're going to use a screen reader. Now, you're going to hear this talk. And Nancy, I'm going to let you tell me if, if, you, can hear, if you can hear that voice uh, well enough. Did you hear what it said? I did originally. North Hollywood. You can hear that okay? Yeah, North Hollywood. Exactly. Okay, great. So if I'm, um, by the way, they're not perfect and sometimes things act weird. So if I have to try and retry something, my apologies in advance. Sometimes just things go goofy um, with, with software. But um, what I would do if I was here uh, visiting this for the first time and or actually for the 17th time even and I were blind, I would first hit the tab key. Enable accessibility for <coughs> impaired button. 
Okay. And so this particular tool is this one down here. It's a company called UserWay. We don't like UserWay for a number of reasons, but um, for example, if I hit enter, it's supposed to enable the accessibility and it's not working. So I'm going to go ahead and tap through this. Not working. Okay. So that's a different problem. Anyway, let's get past that. <clears throat> One big issue with, um, with uh, being able to navigate a website with keyboard only is that you should be able to navigate the menu. Now, this is a very simple menu. It has four things on it, or five if you include order to go. And, but if there were, let's say, drop down menus, that's oftentimes in, uh, creates an issue. And here, it's a very simple menu. I can go wherever I want to go by hitting the tab key, and I can hit, let's say, the enter key or the space bar, and it'll go to the About Us page. Great news. Okay, and you can hear it reading to me and all that kind of good stuff, right? So I'm going to go back to the home page because there's something I want to show you here. So... Um, so anyway, so once I get through that, I, I, might, con con I might continue tabbing through the page because when you tab through the page, you get to all of the focusable items. So if uh, anything that you can that you can click on or um, you know that that'll do something when it gets focused, as you can see, there's a focus ring around that first uh, glass of beer. Um, that's that's a focusable item, and hitting tab oh, gets me from one to the next. Um, and then the other thing I can do is I can skip from heading to heading. I made a big deal about headings before. I'm going to do that now. Come visit our tap room, heading level two. Heading level two. Beer releases, heading level three. Heading level three. Food and events, heading level three. Food and events, heading Merch, level three. Heading level three. Great. Lawless updates and events, heading level two. Great. So that kind of seemed okay, except the fact that at the top of the page, which I kind of skipped because I went to the graphics, um, way up here, there were some other headings. All these things are coded as headings also, and that's not ADA Monday compliant night. the way that you have this done. So anyway, I'm going to kind of skip through because there are a couple of other websites I want to get to, but I want to just show you a couple of the things here that, um, that remember, I said that the person who has disabilities needs to be able to have the same experience as somebody without the disabilities. Watch what happens if I mouse over any Crowler. one of these. Crowler. Crowler, Crowler. So there's two things going on here. First off, um, I can't I can't see this text, right? I'm I let me go back up to where that was. So, so here. Actually, two things going on here. The first one is the fact that they all say Crowler. Crowler graphic visited link. Crowler graphic. They say the exact same thing. For me, as a blind person, I'm not blind, but if I were. These are invisible because they all say the same thing and, they're, and they're, they should be distinct. But the other problem is that I, there's no way for me to bring up this extra text. Crowler. I can do it with a mouse. I can't do it with keyboard and a blind person can't use a mouse because he doesn't know where it's pointing. So somehow or another, well, in this case, I'm not getting the same experience. Crowler. So we have a problem with the naming, Crowler. with, with the, uh, the naming of the images and the way that, that that's built and also um, the fact that I can't enable that mouse over effect. There's a bunch of other problems too. Crowler, view all beer button. Like view all beer, that's a great button. I understand what that means. I hit enter, I get to see more beer. More great. info button. More info. This is a problem. Now you might ask, why is this a problem? More info. Let me just ask, what am I going to see? What am I going to read? What am I going to learn more about? What is this more info going to be about? If I didn't immediately come from, and I can read, I can read all of this text here um, with the keyboard, but if I didn't just do that and I just scanned the buttons, then, and I landed on this, more info, you want more info button. then I have no idea what the more info about. Here's even worse. You all button. You all button. View all buttons. I have three view all buttons and I have no idea what I'm going to be viewing more about. Why? Because the button's coded to just say view all. It doesn't say view all the merchandise, view all the food and events, view all the beer. There are ways to make, let the button say view all, but uh, uh, like have it show still view all for sighted people, but to have the screen reader read different text. It's called screen reader text um, in case you I mean, that makes perfect sense. And, um, and so there are ways to fix this, but 
this has the problem. This is not ADA compliant. You have a ton of other issues too. I'm gonna to scream through them really quickly here. Um, I'm gonna use the mouse just to point and also to navigate from here. And, and Mark means you have those, you have a lot of issues here in the most loving way. And he's oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to be rude, Ben. <laughs> I'm not offended at all, Mark. This okay, is good. This is great, right. thank you. All right. well, well, ben, and Ben may have issues, but you know. Right. <laughs> well, I won't comment on that, but um, but yeah, it's the website that has the issues, not 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 Ben, so far as I know. But um, but there's all sorts of other issues with the website, like this. The images need to be tagged uh, in a certain way. All of these images, I'm going to use the mouse just to bring up this thing. But listen, Lawless Soft Opening 104. Lawless Soft Opening. See the name of the image, Lawless Soft Opening 104. Lawless Soft Opening 89. Lawless Soft Opening 89. Lawless Soft Opening. And so on. These images are not coded properly, so that it explains what they are. They, if if they're not important to the content of, so that somebody who's blind, uh, you know, if they don't really need to know what is in these, and they don't in this case probably, then they should be coded so that they're invisible but they should otherwise be coded so that they're descriptive and they're not. Um, here's a big problem. Your calendar, let me get down there. Table with eight rows and seven. Column Table with eight rows. Column two through six, July, 2022, heading level three. So I can. Sun column seven button next month. I can get, button, hang on a second. Table with eight rows and seven, out of button row two, column one. Row two, column, column one. Oh, July, 2022, column two, Tuesday. Tuesday. July 2022, column three, West. Uh, Wednesday, right? July I don't know why it didn't say Wednesday, but four, anyway, but I, there's no way for me to get to the content or any of those the items in those uh, in the calendar. So I'm going to leave this website now. I think you got a, a good sense about the difference between the the automated testing and the the usability testing, how they're different, how they're both necessary. Uh, they bring up different kinds of issues. There's probably some other uh, issues that I uh, skipped over. Oh, like I'll just mention one other one that when you have a, uh, when you are going, when you go to a, um, here we got it, here, order now. When you go to this order now, you go to some other website and you have to tell the user that they're leaving your website. This is a whole different website. It has its own uh, ADA compliance issues. But uh, just the fact that you're leaving your website, uh, you need to you need to let the user know. So let me um, get to another one of these real quick. Um, and uh, so did, did, uh, just Ben, if you found that helpful um, and you want to talk about this later, we sure can. You you your website's built on WordPress. We're very very good with that, and these are all fixable issues, by the way. Uh, or you can talk to your own web developer just as long as he uh, he knows what it is you know that he needs to fix. But uh, uh, one way or another, you should you should get these issues fixed. Okay. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome, Ben. You're welcome. Okay, Mark, so Mark next Apple one. WCP Chamber. So we have Mark Applegate, who's an insurance agent. Let me turn off the screen reader real quick. Exit and the click exit. Oh. Um, so Mark actually has two websites. We're only really going to look at one. This one is actually owned and run by State Farm. Um, it farmers. have a ton. Are you there, Mark? Yeah, farmers okay. insurance. That's I just want you to know I didn't pick it only because your name is Mark. Um, <laughs> but I, I thought this is an interesting story. Um, but the uh, you know th this is not your website, but they need to fix it. There are some issues with it. I didn't test this as much as I looked at yours. Yours so, might um, and uh, yours has a, a host of issues. Um, and with respect, uh, and, and um, I mean, it, this website was, I think, built many years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, but, a friend of mine built it for me for a dollar, like, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Got it. Um, and the, it has a number of issues with respect to ADA compliance. For example, one of the things we didn't talk about with the other site, but with this one, it's, it's quite apparent. You're not supposed to put text as images on a website. In other words, here you have a heading called our offerings. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's an image. That's what that is. I can't select the text here like I can select this text here. Oh, okay. Um, all same, you have the same problem here with all these buttons. 
as a matter of fact, all of these buttons, which are critically important, actually, there's only two buttons, the first one and the last one, but all the other ones are not buttons. But this is invisible to somebody who is, uh, who's blind or has low vision. Absolutely invisible because screen readers don't read the text that's on a, uh, in an image. So this is a problem. Both of these are the same, same thing. These happen to be buttons, the mail us and the, um, and the, uh, the blog link here, but they, um, again, they have the same problem. These images are not coded just like the uh, images at the Lawless Brewing were not coded properly, neither are these, but it, and, and the text shouldn't be part of it. What's also interesting is that this website has 23 errors, but it has no headings. So this is presumably the only heading on the page, but, let me tell you what's going on here and what, and what the real tragedy of this is. Your website is not going to be found, like it's, it's, it's very much unoptimized for Google. Google doesn't see this either. And Google, uh, remember as we were talking about with the headings, all of those headings and the structure of everything, Google looks at all of that for, um, for uh, uh, SEO to understand the meaning of a page and what the content on a page. And most of the stuff on your website, with the exception of this little outline here and, and this little stuff down here, it's all invisible to Google. It's not text and, and uh, you're not gonna get ranked for anything. So your website should be doing a number of things to help your business. One of them is to be found on Google and this one is just not capable of, of doing that. Um, at least not in any competitive sense. But you also have, you can see here, missing alternative text for all these images. So this one has, none of these have alt text. So uh, alt text is the the, word, the uh, textual descriptions of what's in each of these images. Um, and you have a variety of other issues in here as well. But uh, I, I think that pretty much covers uh, what's going on here. Let me see any contrast issues. No, said no contrast issues. So that's good news, right? All the text you do have is dark enough. And it's, I will say also, this is fairly small text. And for somebody who is um, uh, visually impaired, they're going to have a hard time finding this, they have a hard time seeing it. So also these all go to different websites. These need to be coded to tell the user that they're about to leave your website when they do that and so on. So um, if, uh, I mean, it, it, it seems to me it, it, it now may, might be a good time for you to, uh, to avoid a lawsuit and maybe get that fixed. Um, and uh, I'd encourage you to do that if you have, if your friend is still doing that and, and can build you a more modern contemporary website with ADA features, that'd be great. Yeah, so. I've already started, uh, beginning of your talk, I started drafting an email to him because I had a feeling um, mine was not compliant. So, I, and I mostly use this <coughs> as links for people looking for Mexican insurance or health insurance, so. Well, I, I will mention one other thing, um, and that is that one of the worst things, uh, let me see, one of the biggest problems with your website is, I'm, whoever that is, if you could mute your phone, that'd be great. Uh, mute your microphone. I mean, um, one of the biggest issues with this website is that it's not um, responsive. Right. So when you try to look at it on a phone, this is what you see. And unless you pinch in and try to see it, you know, make it bigger and you're going to scroll back and forth and everything, it's, it's really not helpful. <coughs> so, so I hope that was helpful, Mark. I appreciate the critique. Yes, it was. You're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, best of success. And then the last one I'm going to look at right now is for Richie's Diner, which is a really cool looking website. Um, and it uh, um, uh, has a variety of issues as well. Um, and, and again, I, with, with um, um, a sense of giving and respect, I'm, I'm telling you this, right? I don't mean to insult anybody. Uh, this website has some errors. Let's have a look at what they are, some empty buttons. These are probably empty buttons that exist for the mobile version of the page, which are currently hidden, which is why they're listed like that. So mostly these are contrast issue, contrast errors. Uh, and we can click this and go find out where they are. Um, sometimes this tool does stuff like this. It looks like it's white on white or something like that. It's kind of hard to sometimes interpret the uh, what's going on with this, but uh, with this tool, but nonetheless, um, like this is fine and this is actual text, you know, this is good, has high contrast, everything is fine. But I think what it's reacting to is that 
on some parts of this background, the text may be too light. Um, again, that particular contrast measurement is not always, uh, not always accurate. Um, let's see, one of the other things that, uh, that I think is very important to look at, remember we talked about the head, the structure with the headings. Um, notice you have an H2 and H3, three H1, four H1s, an H2 and so on. Um, is the owner of this site here on the call? Yes, I am. Wonderful, beautiful website. I'm sure the food is delicious. I've been to Temecula and I enjoy going down there. Uh, my aunt Thank used you. to live in the, in the area at Canyon Lake, actually. So I was down there not uh, more, more than a few times. And um, so this website is built on Squarespace. Um, and one of the things that I noticed is two, two new issues I'll mention that were, um, well, one issue I'm going to kind of repeat, but and then one other brand new issue I'm going to tell you about that's really a problem. The first one is that you have no H1. Okay, a page should have one and only one, a single H1 tag at the top of the page that tells Google this is what the page is about. You have four H1 tags all competing for what the page is about. Gotcha. Now that's an SEO comment, but from a, which, so in other words, you're not doing as well for SEO as you could or should be. You should have an H1 that says Temecula Diner or you know, Riverside down or wherever the, the, uh, the location are, right? Murrieta, I think is one of the other ones, right? So, and Ratch and Cucamonga. But you should have something about like best diner in San Bernardino or Riverside County, I think is where you are. So uh, it should be something like that. That's an SEO comment, but there should be one and only one H1 at the top, followed by one or more H2s and so on. So you're, it, it, what's interesting is that, that, and I'll mention this later, eight, that SEO stuff and ADA accessibility stuff sometimes overlap. Nancy, I can tell we're going to go over by about 10 minutes at least. Um, so I hope that's okay. I, I think everyone's fascinated. So. Okay, good. All right. Um, so, so that's one issue that I, would, that I would for sure deal with. And the other issue that I think is really important for you to deal with, I'm going to turn off the, uh, the testing tool here, um, is your menus. That... PDFs, your menu is presented to the world on this website as a PDF or as several PDFs and they're beautiful. And I applaud your graphic designer that he, did a, he or she did a wonderful job. It's gorgeous stuff, makes me hungry, I wanna go. Uh, the problem is this is not ADA compliant. I don't know how to read this. And so what you need to have when, when there's a graphic or a file like this that is not ADA compliant, you need to give an ADA compliant um, alternative. So even though you have this beautiful stuff, I would encourage you to create a text version of this on your website as well. Um, I know it's a lot of work, and um, but you know it's really it's all the same text, and you're gonna you know th that's what you should do, or you can pay somebody to make your PDFs ADA compliant, it is possible to do. They, you know, it is possible to have heading levels and all that kind of stuff and to help people navigate through this and have links to skip through and all sorts of stuff. And, um, but, and, and to, to like label, uh, you know, text alternatives to all the images and so on. But with, uh, but, but this is, is effectively invisible to somebody with, um, uh, with vision problems, and it's something that is uh, puts you at risk for getting sued. And that's really the point for all of these things: is that all of these issues put you at risk for getting sued, especially when you're in hospitality. Especially, well, it's both of you are you know Lawless and Richies are in hospitality, but they're going after every kind of small business, and nobody is immune, and everybody's going to get nailed at some point or another if those. Um, professional plaintiffs have their way. So that is, um, that is all that. And uh, I'm going to return to, uh, to the PowerPoint. Let me know when you're ready for questions. Uh, we can do a couple questions now. It'll give me an opportunity to have a swig of water and dry my throat. Um, or we can just, you, you tell me how-, how... Well, 
Like first one? of all, first of all, I want everyone to know that you will, we will give you a link to the recording of this. We we're, we need to trim the video at the beginning of the end because we had some chit chat going on, and then um, we will put it on our YouTube channel and we will send out the link. If there's any other chambers that just want the raw recording that you put on your own YouTube channel, let us know, and we're happy to supply it. And Mark, are you going to give us the PowerPoint to give to everyone? I can make a PDF of it. That would be, um, however, that would be awesome. Um, I do not believe that PowerPoint makes a, a, a ADA compliant PDF. I didn't make this be distributed. So <laughs> with, uh, with that warning, I don't know, perhaps I can just export some text or something to be a text equivalent or something like that. So okay, well, we're just going to email it as an attachment. Um, I will not comment on, <laughs> on anything related to that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. okay. So the first question is, um, Actually, we only have a couple because one of them, I'm just going to throw this out there for the breweries. You guys should all talk because it just says, curious if any other breweries on this webinar use Square as their point of sale system for their website. They've had many difficulties making their website compliant through Square. Mark, I don't know if you know anything about that. I don't know anything about using Square as a POS on the web. Um, so I'm afraid I can't comment on that. But if if either any of them want to show me what the issues are or whatever, I mean, this just seems like a technical issue, not a not an ADA issue. Is that right? Well, I, th I think the ADA component of um, Square is not working right. Is that correct? I don't remember who asked the question. I'm happy to note that in there. And Levi mentioned that. Okay, a few different breweries do. Um, we use Square as a POS system, but... Specifically, we don't have any access to the backend code with Square, nor are they willing to provide it. So I was trying to see if anyone else is running into this issue. So if a brewery is, can you guys like connect? I mean, maybe put your, your information in the chat and everyone can connect on that. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah, we use Square. It's run by Weebly. Okay, well, well, that's gonna be something we're gonna talk about. That's another question. So let me go through the questions. Mm -hmm. Um, so what web builders would you recommend, Mark? And what ones do you not recommend? Like, is Weebly a good website builder? The, the, to my knowledge, Weebly um, and uh, Squarespace and Wix and GoDaddy and anything like that, they all have the same kind of problems. And the, just so you know, the problems originate because they have a small group of developers who are working on making a website this website builder do almost everything that somebody might want to put on a website. And by contrast, WordPress um, is not run by a small company. WordPress is run by uh, really nobody in particular, but like tens of thousands of people all over the world, all of whom are trying to make it better. And it's, it's called open source software, but also um, there are there's the ability to add different kinds of modules and other other things to a WordPress website. If uh, we specialize, when we build websites, we build WordPress websites. Um, and and they're excellent and they we can do just about anything with a WordPress website. That's what I would recommend. If you have a heavily e-commerce store, WordPress with WooCommerce works really well, but another alternative is Shopify. However, with no matter which of those two you use, you also have to make sure that you, well, let me just say this way. With WordPress, Shopify, and some other systems, you there's the system itself, and then there are things that you add to the system. Some of those things that you add would be um, referred to as plugins or add-ons, and then separate from that are what are called themes. Themes basically control how the website looks within which you can do programming and other things to change the functionality. And then separate from that, there's all this functionality stuff that add-ons and plugins do. You not only have to care about the, 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 the platform you use, WordPress versus Shopify or something else, but the, the ADA accessibility of the theme and the plugins as well. I bring that up and I spent so much time on that specifically because we are just now like right now dealing with a really large e-commerce women's wear clothing site that was built on Shopify. It's a beautiful site, it's even very minimalistic, but it has hundreds, lit, like we had dozens maybe of errors on a page or tens, not even. There are hundreds of errors on those pages. And it's because the theme 
was not built well. Uh, it was not built to be ADA compliant. So you have to make sure that all the different parts are ADA compliant. So it was a really good question, Nancy. Okay, I th that was not my question. <laughs> Kudos to whoever asked the question. Yes. Um, okay, is the WAVE tool as good as paid accessibility monitoring tools? Um, I use more than just WAVE. There are other tools as well. And um, uh, the, really the, the most important thing to do, if it were me, is I would, I would use several tools to, uh, to, to check the accessibility of my website. Um, we have another tool down here that tells me, where is it here? Here we go, the Axe Dev Tools that also will scan my page and tell me how many errors I have. Um, so this one reports 16, but as we saw, we had a different number when we used Wave. Then there's another one called Ace. I mean, there's there's tons. So the answer is, uh, it depends on the individual tool. Just because it's paid doesn't mean it's great or better. And I think that the most important thing is for you to use, have somebody who knows how to use a screen reader actually try to use the website. Uh, don't just rely on an automated tool. That's the best advice I can give you with that. Are there any good WordPress plugins that check for and correct ADA compliance issues? Um, if it were me, well, I mean, it's kind of the same question, right? The, yeah. I, I don't, we've used some of these tools before, the, these here, and they fix some specific issues. So for example, if you had low contrast like this, a tool like this will allow you to change the contrast like that and, 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 and instantly fix it. And then that means your website doesn't really have to fix it on its own, even though it's better to fix it. Um, but the, this particular tool frequently causes other problems, this user way tool, at least in my experience, it does. And here, let me turn off, reset, there we go. Um, there are some, I, I've never found one that was built specifically for WordPress that did everything I wanted it to do. We have um, one website that we built using one that does a pretty good job, but we, the way that we work, and I'll tell you more about this in a few minutes, and when we continue the webinar is we, we do a combination of automated, like little overlays and stuff like that, but we, we combine that with actually manually fixing the website. Uh, and, uh, and we find that is the highest level of uh, accessibility. So um, another web designer's on here and he said that WordPress uses third-party plugins and requires updates all the time. Sometimes things will stop working after updates and custom coding can be wiped out after an update. Do you have any comment? Um, yes, um, he is correct in many ways that, uh, th that the software is being updated all the time. I view that as a benefit, not a, a, uh, uh, as a negative and uh, as a detriment. And the reason is because things change. We have, you know, we used to not have responsive websites. Now we have responsive websites. We used to not have, um, you know, video on, and now we have video and so on. And, and it's like all these, there's technology that changes all the time with social media and all these kinds of things. You want your website your and the individual components of your website to be continually updated. And you want them to be updated by people who are expert at updating that particular kind of thing. I want this video expert updating the video plugin. I want that um, uh, you know, um, th let's say uh, the responsive one. I mean, I, I want different experts doing all different things. It's what we do in in my uh, in my company is we well, look when you when you have something. Uh, your website requires maintenance. It just does, and you should not plan on setting it, forgetting it, because when you do that, other things happen. Because the underlying stuff, the hosting company. The, the language that the website's written in and all sorts of other things, those change too, even if let's say you didn't update your software, things will break in almost any kind of a system, even Weebly, Wix, GoDaddy and all that kind of stuff, um, things can break and you need to maintain your website. And it's not the kind of, it's like, just like you know owning a car or your house, you're gonna wanna maintain it. You invested some time, some money in it. 
if it's if your business is a good going concern, you're going to want to invest money. Oh, in I was. <laughs> Mark, you know, you brought this up when one of the other breweries had a problem. They had a new website, but their old website was still accessible for someone to find. Remember, And so I, I was saying this to people who are building new websites. If your old website isn't ADA compliant, you got to make sure it's not up where people can find it. Right. Well, I'm not sure. I don't recall. I'm sorry, Nancy, exactly which site that was and, and, and the context in which the old site was still. They, they were launching their new website, but their old one was still available. Yeah, I just don't remember which one yeah. it was. So, I'm but, but I'm just but I, I'm just making a comment that I think that people need to be aware of that. OK, because that's what opened that that's what opened that brewery up to a lawsuit. Oh, that's right. There was, yeah, that's right. They, they got their their old website was the one that was found and evaluated and sued and, and was the basis of the lawsuit, even though they were building or just about to launch the new one. I, but I, again, I don't right. remember. Yeah. Thing. So just something to be aware of and go back to the webinar. <laughs> Okie dokie. All right. So um, I hope I hope the demonstration was valuable because I, I and, and it's just that when you hear about a blind person needs to be able to, um, a blind people a person needs to be able to use the website, you think, well, how could that possibly be? And I hope this was, um, no pun intended, eye-opening, um, so that, you know, you can understand exactly what the issues are and why they're issues and why this is not just plain nonsense. So I'm going to turn off my video here and we are going to continue. So, um, so anyway, I mentioned earlier that there are thousands of, uh, prof you can see my screen, Nancy? Yes. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier, there's thousands of professional plaintiffs who've made an actual business out of looking for non-compliant websites. And now that you have a partial list of common ADA violations, uh, you can kind of see how easy it is for them to test for these things and, and file lawsuits. Their teams can each evaluate uh, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of websites every day, sometimes by going alphabetically by domain name. Sometimes they target a website by age. So we saw a, a very old, I guess, 15 or 20 year old website in this uh, today. Um, they, look for, they look for old plain HTML sites that aren't even mobile responsive and they file lawsuits. And sometimes they search by industry as we talked about earlier a couple of times, acupuncturists, breweries, hospitality businesses of all kinds have all been targeted, even e-commerce. And sometimes they search geographically by business location Recently, they seem to be targeting uh, Shopify sites, like I mentioned. And, and what they're doing is they're looking, they're looking for targets. They're, lo <clears throat> they're looking for the best, easiest, and most sure thing targets for their lawsuits. And they look for websites that are clearly inaccessible and owned by businesses that are likely to have better things to do with their time and money than fight a long, expensive court battle that they know that they're going to lose anyway. So my goal today was to make you aware of these issues to protect your own business, but also so that you can talk to your own friends, colleagues, and clients and help them to be less of a target too. And whether that means you or they talk to a current or previous web developer to do a lengthy manual remediation of your website, or you talk to my company where we have developed a more efficient AI-based solution that makes your website ADA compliant faster and easier, it doesn't matter, whatever it is, my goal is, I'm sure that uh, probably your goal too, is that we let somebody else be the target. Um, in addition to protecting your business, there, by the way, are three other really good reasons for making your website accessible. The first is making your website usable by those with disabilities. It's just the right thing to do for millions of people who encounter obstacles like, it's like stairs in front of a business um, on a daily basis. In fact, people with uh, the kinds of disabilities I mentioned make up between 10 to 15% of the population. So and that's by some estimates, um, but uh, making your website accessible might even lead to a boost in, your, in business. And making your website accessible is also better for search engine optimization and your rankings on Google, since many of the WCAG requirements overlap proper SEO requirements that are often skipped by sloppy developers. So fixing a non-compliant site is called remediation. And what most people have done up to now is what we call a brute force manual remediation. They assess the site according to those 90 guidelines. Then manually, we only kind of touched on a few, right? And then they manually reprogram every broken element of a site page by page, piece by piece. Often the website will have to be redesigned. And, uh, and sometimes it takes so much work uh, to remediate that some people just end up throwing out the old website and building a new one, which is often a really good idea. 
it can take between a month to six months to manually remediate a website, depending on how big the website is. I mean, if it's thousands of pages. And the technology uh, also depends on the technology that is used to build the website. So brute force manual remediation is slow. And as you can imagine, if it's gonna take that much time, it also, uh, it's, if it's gonna take that much time with all programming, it's gonna uh, take a lot of uh, design hours. It's also gonna be very expensive. And here's the shocking thing, manual remediation, the brute force method is temporary. That means that next month or next year, if you wanna change the way your website looks, if you wanna change the colors or branding or anything about the website or functionality of your site, even add new pages or images, then you have to go through a manual remediation process to examine those changes all over again. It's even worse if the laws of the WCAG standards change as they will probably this year, you have to remediate the website again based on those standards. And so manual remediation is technically speaking temporary. So that's how most ADA uh, developers do it, uh, if they know how to do it at all, but that's not the way that we do it. Our process is a bit different. We have developed a system called the Intelligent Accessibility Compliance System. The IACS is a lot faster because we use artificial intelligence technology to review the entire website and automatically remediate the website over the first 48 hours. Our tool is very, very good, but it cannot predict every kind of weird programming on every website. Just like we saw today, there's some weird stuff uh, going on on some websites. So uh, it catches about 90% of all the issues, sometimes as high as 95 or 99%, sometimes it's 80 something percent. But that's when we do our assessment, right? So then we check to see if there are any issues still remaining. It's a much smaller assessment. And if it, takes, if it shows that any issues remain, there are far fewer of them. So we manually remediate just those few remaining items and then we post an accessibility statement and an accessibility feedback form on your website, both of which are also big additional deterrents to people threatening lawsuits. And all that, that entire process typically happens within a couple of weeks. And as you can imagine, because there's far less manual remediation for us to do, the process is far less expensive than old fashioned brute force remediation. And what really makes our clients happy while they are working with us is that our system is more permanent because of three very important reasons. <coughs> First, our AI technology automatically rescans the site every 24 hours and looks for changes. When it finds them, it does its magic and automatically remediates them if it can. Second, we manually review your website on the schedule and look for other issues that might have gotten past our system. And if you find them, we use the hours built into every one of our plans to manually remediate them. And finally, our AI technology is already being upgraded to WCAG 2.2. So when that becomes the new standard, your website will already meet that standard. And one thing that's not written here on this slide, but it's uh, also important for many businesses, our solution does not change the design of your website. When someone with disabilities arrives at your site with our solution installed, they can customize the look of the website just for themselves to accommodate their particular disability, but no one else sees those changes. And so now instead of it being slow, expensive tempor and temporary, it's fast and expensive and permanent. And finally, here's a bit of good news. And this is maybe worth uh, staying the what hour and uh, uh, 15 minutes to hear this. Um, the federal government is so very much concerned with making sure every business is ADA compliant that they have special tax credits and tax deductions to help make the work more affordable. So now, as, just as I said before that I'm not a lawyer, I'm also, you might've guessed it, not a CPA. And so do not take what I say as tax advice. Please consult your personal tax advisor for your own tax planning. The ADA actually altered the tax code. According to the ADA website, the IRS code allows a tax credit for small businesses and a tax deduction for all businesses. <coughs> so let's talk about tax credits first. Businesses with a million dollars total revenue or less uh, in the prior tax year or 30 or fewer full-time employees are eligible for tax credit for website ADA compliance costs. Those costs can, um, the, the credit can cover up to 50% of the one, first $10,000 in qualified expenses. In other words, if the cost of remediating your website is over $10,000, you may be eligible to receive a tax credit for your business of up to $5,000. To apply for the tax credit, uh, for website ADA compliance, consult your tax advisor. He or she will direct you to IRS form 8826, the disabled access credit form, which you will attach to your tax return among uh, tax forms. It's probably the simplest form ever created by the IRS. 
It only needs eight numbers and the IRS has already given you two of them. And not only might you be eligible for a tax credit, but your business might also be eligible for a tax deduction for website ADA compliance as well. Section 190 of the IRS code says that the ADA tax deduction is available to all businesses with a maximum deduction of $15,000 per year. So even if you don't qualify for tax credit, you may still qualify for tax deduction. And the tax deduction and tax credit can be used together. So if, you, if the cost of your compliance expenses exceeds the credit amount, you can get a deduction too. So if in general cost was preventing you from making your website ADA compliant, now that can be much less of a concern for you. And I will add also one other thing that um, if it, what this means to me, and again, I'm not a CPA, but what this means to me is if you needed to toss out your old, your old website because it was too difficult to make ADA compliant, if you were to build a new website with the purpose of making it ADA compliant, it would seem to me that the IRS is going to be paying a big chunk of that for you as well. So um, finally, if you're interested in knowing what your own company's risk is, if you want me to do, um, it, we won't, uh, well, if we want us to do a, a cursory evaluation of your website and help determine if your website is a good or bad target for an ADA lawsuit and to show you what it will take to make your website ADA and privacy compliant, you can go to my website at webcompliancepro.com chamber and enter your website's URL, answer a few questions to see if you uh, qualify for a free risk evaluation. And I'll tell you right now that if you're on this call, you do. And I invite you to recommend that your friends, colleagues, and clients do the same. And remember, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the, I'm sorry, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the other companies whose websites are not going to be as compliant as yours. Those professional plaintiffs are out there targeting businesses like yours. They're targeting businesses with the least compliant websites and who are least likely to want to engage in a lawsuit that they know they're going to lose. So my... Um, admonition, not admonition, my encouragement to you is to let someone else be the target ask for an evaluation today. And uh, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Fiumi. Thank you, the San Fernando Valley Chamber for putting all this together. Thank you, all the other chambers and the uh, Brewery Association. Uh, and we have a couple more questions, Mark. Okie dokie, I'm here. How detailed does the alt text need to be for an image? The image should describe, not extremely, right? It should describe what it is. So for example, if you look at this image here, um, the image could, an alt tag could be that uh, um, two people sitting at a conference table, one of them blind or something like that. I mean, it, it's it not does, you know, you don't have to say man with checkered shirt, you know, woman with dark glasses. It depends. It depends on, here's the thing. If, 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 if there's a point to the image being there, then you might want to write about the point of the image being there, right? Right. So it's, it could be like the caption for this in that context would be, uh, blind woman sitting at a laptop with a friend, you know, something like that. So not terribly. I mean, alt text shouldn't be more than a few words. So um, okay. like it shouldn't be, you know, I think there's a limit to 151 characters or something like that. So it can't be too long. So, you know, earlier we talked about square um, issues. Um, do you, are you familiar with any issues involving toast as a point of sale? Don't even know. Never heard of it. Um, okay. So if anyone else is using Toast and you're having issues with your point of sale with ADA compliance and stuff, put it in the chat and get together. And then another question, once you are ADA compliant, is there a badge that alerts visitors to your compliance? Um, well, that's a great question. So one of the, let me, let me just kind of show you one thing that I think the, uh, the folks at Lawless did really well. As at the bottom uh, they, why do I not see it now? Bottom left. No, no, I don't want to see this. There's, there was a, uh, maybe it was, hang on. Maybe it was this website. Okay. So there's an excessive, this is what every website should do if they're going to be doing anything with accessibility. So it's Richie's Diner has this, they have an accessibility statement that says we do all of the following to make our website ADA compliant. This is a very, very short ADA compliance statement, but the point of it is this, that it says we're working really hard. We care about this. We're working hard. We made a lot of effort and we know that our work is not done. If you come across any issues, let us know and we're going to fix it right away. Um, and you can, by the way, this should have a phone number on it and it doesn't um, because sometimes somebody might not be able to, uh, you know, email from this or something, but there should be a phone number here as well. But, um, but, 
an accessibility statement is something that you would make yourself and you'd, you'd put on it. Um, also, these badges are sometimes seen as, you know, they're not certificates in any by any means, as I think I, would, I pretty convincingly showed you that that adding something like this does not make your website ADA compliant. Um, but it's an indication that you're that you know about it, you care about it for whatever that's worth. Um, but the accessibility statement is a better thing to have. Um, but the even better thing to have is to have your website be actually ADA compliant. I was actually on the state of California's website today for a grant we have, and they have this accessibility thing, much more detailed, but very, you know, and I was impressed. Um, okay, another, one more question. How do you protect for cognitive disabilities? Okay, so there are, I, I'm not as familiar with all of those regulations. I will say this, that if we go to this homepage here, um, you know, one in the category of cognitive disabilities is epilepsy. And um, one of the requirements is that you be able to stop a video because um, a cognitive disability might be something like, I can't understand what's going on here. This is way too fast. I got to be able to slow this thing down. And so they need to be able to stop this video. This particular tool happens to have the, um, the ability to do that, which is great. So our tool does as well. But, um, but the, one of the other things that, um, that can that, that is uh, under the category of cognitive disabilities as I think I mentioned already um, epilepsy and triggering seizures and if you have flashing things on your website that used to be very common a few years ago then um, the flashing things can um, can trigger epileptic seizures so um, you have to so that's that's the basis really of, of the uh, cognitive disability stuff. Well, that ends our questions. Um, I want to thank Mark for this amazing webinar. So give him a virtual round of applause. Um, I'm going to close this with, um, we're going to, well, I mentioned we're going to send you the video, the, the link, and we'll get you something in writing that's maybe the PowerPoint or maybe something in a Word doc. Um, but I'm going to just close this with a story. Mark started with a story. I'm going to end it with a story. So was it last year when that Elton John movie came out? What was it called? Oh, boy. Okay. Rocket, Rocket Man. Man. Rocket Man. Rocket Man. So yeah. my girlfriend tells me I need to watch Rocket Man. And I had just rebooted my smart TV. And I put on my Amazon Prime. And I go to watch it. And it says... Elton is walking down the street wearing a yellow shirt and around him, the trees are blowing. I'm thinking, what is this weird? I'm watching this for half an hour. Like, a, like thinking, this is the weirdest movie. It's like a documentary. It was on the, web, the accessibility for people who can't <laughs> see. Right. But it took me half an hour of watching it thinking it was the worst movie around <laughs> because I couldn't understand why it was describing everything. So even when you're on your smart TV, it has accessibility options options yeah so re remember that if you're ever looking for something so well, again so your, wants... your cell phone too by the way your mobile phone has yeah. yeah well again um thanks to, but i also i see brian from hamburg's here i want to thank brian from hamburg beer for sending me a text message to tell me about the lawyers who are going around um suing all the breweries and um to franny if she's here from the la brewers guild for rallying all the brewers together and to anyone I met at the BFE last week because I was there and I talked to you about coming to the webinar today and to all of our chamber partners thank you so much for being here we really appreciate your collaboration that we've been doing for many years and um, we look forward to working with all of you again and if your chamber does not have a web compliance person you know where to find Mark and if you don't have an attorney, that if you're being sued, um, we have chamber members that do that. If your chamber doesn't already have that type of attorney, or Mark can also give you a referral as well. So thanks for being here, everyone. Um, we're going to let you go about the rest of your day. And round of applause again for Mark, and we will see you soon. Thanks so much, Nancy.